Hey there Akuma fans, Charlie with the Gossiker Application staff. Today's video we're going to talk about CAS, Collision Avoidance Software. A bunch of you that are subscribers are going to throw up a fit and say, wait a second, you've got a million videos on CAS. Today's is a little different. All of my previous videos have been focusing on multitasking machines like the Multis, the U machine, the LT, complicated turning centers where Akuma has included the collision avoidance software as standard. But today we're going to demonstrate a the collision avoidance system on a regular MB4000, a horizontal a machine that the factory has not included collision avoidance as standard but it's certainly available as a bolt-on. So we will talk about CAS and let you decide whether or not it's an investment that you'd like to have on your milling center in order to protect it from silly little mistakes. First off, what is CAS? Collision avoidance software is boiled down to its nuts and bolts is a virtual mock-up of your machining center that will operate one step ahead of where you are in order to prevent you from lumping the machine either in manual mode or automatic mode any sort of little mistake that would normally cost you a, a broken tool a crashed machine a, a pretty little signature in your vice deck all the little things that have happened to every last one of us in the industry at least once uh, the collision avoidance software will look ahead see that this is about to happen and stop so let's show the layout basically first and then we'll talk about how to construct the collision avoidance software on the left side of your screen over here you'll see the normal p300 m control just about everybody's seen this at least once upper left hand corner has the dro with some of the uh, the modal information program is underneath it next to it is the gnm codes that are active and up above is the graphic screen and most people on a mill they ignore the graphic screen because eh, all right i know what's going on however with a collision avoidance equipped machine by touching this upper right hand corner you can make the value of f2 change to cast display by touching it there is the mock-up of my machine as i have defined it and again we're going to go through how to do that definition in just a second but let's let's see the thing in action first and then we'll go through and um, uh, show you how to populate things so this can be run the machine can be run with the uh the, the window up here it's, it's delightful to be able to see what's going on especially if you've got a lot of coolant splashing the door you can't physically see the part i'm just going to go ahead and go into automatic mode and hit cycle slam and we're going to watch my uh my part as it goes through its process now this uh this cast window that you see here is probably not easy to see through your monitor so i'm going to come over to at my vertical function keys and i'm going to enlarge the whole thing so that i can see what the heck's going on you notice that the first thing my program did was pick up a shell mill it decked the top of the part yeah, that's pretty routine second i grabbed a half inch end mill and i'm running around the outside you notice that the uh, the graphic showed the tool path before the tool was complete that's part of that look ahead function even though the graphic is showing me exactly where the machine is now the computer is already thinking ahead and showing me what the material is going to look like in several blocks that's how it's making sure that it doesn't stop a a collision as it happens <laughs> that wouldn't do me any good so it is physically looking ahead and will warn me before things uh, get out of hand now the end mill is done walking around the outside i do a couple of other little things here we're going to grab a spot drill and just uh, make three little holes again you'll notice that the hole is occurring before the drill goes in it's because of that look ahead process and then my final tool i'm just going to grab a half inch drill and just plunge zirp, zirp, in and out of the three holes and then my completed part stands yeah okay go ahead somebody give me a rough time for not breaking the edges and yeah, yeah we're, we're just demonstrating so now let's uh, let's induce a few mistakes i'm going to get into my program here and 
I will scroll down to the end of the shell mill because this is the first place where I could very easily make a programming error. At the end of the decking process, I send the shell mill back to the zero point uh, for whatever reason. My reason was because I wanted to induce a crash. Then perhaps my clearance uh, command at the end of every tool would be to say G0, Z, some number that's beyond the physical travel of the machine, like 90 inches, as you see right here. But somebody messed up. I'm not going to take responsibility, but minus 90 instead of positive 90, I've got the negative in there. That I know is a crash. However, I didn't catch it. Let's let the machine catch it for me. Hit cycle start, the machine starts over again. Let's go back to our, our uh, uh, larger depiction. Make sure everybody's in super speed mode. And after this third leg, the shell mill goes back to zero, zero. And now the machine stops. I get this big yellow block that says, hey, a collision block is detected. Notice that physical, uh, the physical location of my machine is still a hundred thousandths. However, it's saying, oh, whoop, whoop, on this move right here, you are about to take your tool and plunge into your material. Wow, all right, so let's reset that. I'm gonna get rid of the, um, get rid of that particular motion. Oh yeah, Charlie, you made a mistake. It's supposed to be Z plus 90. And a little further down, I wanna show you another little oops that I can do. I have defined this tool as having about 1.3 inches of flute. So now let's take this and I'm gonna overdrive that tool. I'm going to try to make a finish pass with more flute engaged than I have flute to spare. So let's go ahead and fire this off again. And as it's running, I'll point out that um, I have added a, right in the beginning of my program, I've added the word clear and draw, which is the only program difference or the only pr program requirement for using CAS. The clear and draw just reset my blank to where it belongs uh, as it's untouched. Okay, so now we are running the, sh the end mill around the outside of the part. And we're gonna get to that portion where I overdrive. Now, I also wanna warn you that um, my program is utilizing that move right there as a finish pass. It is not leaving any material on this face right so when this thing goes down, it's going to make that first portion of the pass. But now it's telling me, whoa, notice I've got a red mark on the material and a red mark on the tool. It's telling me, hey, I am just about to engage material with too much, uh, too much flute. So let's reset this guy. I'm going to get him out of the way. You gotta be in manual mode, get him out of the way. So convenient, right? Well, that's not the end of the story. I also have protection from me getting all crazy with the, um, the pulse generator. Let's say for instance, I was just not paying any attention and I am hand wheeling the machine and bonk, uh oh. I just jogged the tool into the, uh, the work holding. Now, tombstones should never be machined. So as soon as this guy got within a hundred thousandths of the zoomp of the tombstone, it said, nope, 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 I'm gonna stop. Same thing with the vice. Same thing with, whoa, let's go the other way. Same thing with the material block. Oh, that's a little Why? There we go. Bunk. So I can't even jog the machine and crash it myself. It's not even giving me the permission to do that. All right. So it seems pretty cool, right? 
let's talk about how to set this thing up. There are some key pieces of this puzzle that I have the ability to define through each of these, um, uh, through the software that's embedded and included with the collision avoidance software. It's all under easy modeling. So if I touch this guy, those of you that um, have played around with your control extensively, you probably have seen this easy modeling button. And if you don't have the CAS software, you'll notice that there are only two uh, fields on this left side that you can define, a tool and a blank. Well, now we have a whole series of things that we can define. A machining envelope, which is described as the entire setup. I have a setup right now. Let's go ahead and create a machining environment under my work setup. If I touch the collision avoidance field here, I get F1, define jig and material. By calling this up, there is my machining environment as I have defined it. And we're gonna go through each one of these steps as, uh, as we need to, but I'm also once I've set up a job and I know this thing might be coming back, I have the ability to save that machining envelope and we'll just call this the CAS test and say, okay, now I have saved this machining envelope and it will show up in my machining envelope as CAS test. That way I only have to define this this configuration one time. When this job comes back and I'm ready to set it up, I'll simply get into my de defining jig and material, and I can read the machining envelope, pick up the cast test and say, okay, and there it is, everything's come up. So I'm going to delete and delete all, there we go. Now we will transfer it to CAS and we'll see a blank slate. I've got nothing in there. There is a tool there. We're gonna go through defining that as well. But let's go into our easy modeling and start talking about each one of these little items, such as a blank. There's a piece of material. I can create a new piece of material simply by touching the word new. If I have a casting that's a little complicated, I could make a rotate shape, which means I'm just gonna make a point to point line and then rotate the shape about it. We all have done that in our CAD systems or a basic shape such as a square block, a hole, a rectangular, or a cylindrical. I can create any, any kind of material that's a basic primitive shape simply by defining where is my point one in X, Y, and Z, where's my point two in X, Y, and Z, that's showing the, the square, and the Z high point, the Z low point. Once I've saved it out, boom, it'll look just like so. I can tell it where the, uh, where the datum is gonna be on this part with the assigned P0. And once that's done, I save it because, hey, I may use this down the road somewhere and I can have as many as I want in here. The, uh, the storage memory is vast. The next field is a fixture. Now, a fixture is defined as a vise or a tombstone or a, a homemade fixture plate with clamps on it, whatever in the world you want. So let's just look through some of the things that I've already defined. I have a basically a chick vise. Uh, the, I downloaded this chick vise directly from the chick website. You notice it's a little lumpy. Well, chick wants to give me a, an STP that's very complicated. And so I used a feature called shrink wrap, which just basically encompasses everything. It is exactly what it sounds like. It throws a shrink wrap around the outside of the part and reduces the size of the file. There is a 9,000 triangle maximum on the, the uh, uh, fixtures that come in and the tools that come in. So when I create STLs, I want them to be as simple as possible. But let's go along and look at a few more. I have a tombstone that's saved in here. Here is my, this is a really cool one. This is a double um, fifth axis dovetail vise. 
that I uh, created and brought in. Uh, anything that I own, I can store in this library and then s slap them together. Here's a Kurt vise with the forward jaw. Here's the uh, the moving jaw for the Kurt, so I could put those two in and position them just right so that um, the uh, uh, collision avoidance protects both the hard jaw, the soft jaw, the moving, everything. A set tool is described as a tool that's already assembled. It's got a holder and a tool uh, included in the graphic. Uh, this is great if you have a tool that, uh, let's say for instance, a shell mill, where the relationship between the tool and the holder never changes. And so you can save this thing as a set tool and you can have it set to the side. And anytime you put it back in, you just say, hey, remember that set tool? Put it in my magazine. I have individual tools that I've created. Let's, uh, this will be a fun one. Let's go through and create a tool just to see how we would do it. So I'll just say, hey, I want a new tool. A non-cutting tool would be, of course, a probe, a sensor, but the rotating tool gives me a uh, template of all of the different types of tools that Akuma knows how to create. And if one does not fall into the category, I have a, a, an item called other where I get to define what the protected uh, shape of the tool is. But let's just do something easy like a, oh, a flat end mill, or let's do a bull nose. That's a radius end mill as opposed to a ball end mill. This will be a bull nose. And by saying, okay, I just go through and define the shape of the tool. I'm currently in metric. I like to, to operate this, uh, this in metric. So let's just do that for now. My D1 shown on my compass rose is the cutting diameter of the tool. Let's call this, oh, let's make it a 12.7. Uh, let's, and my shank diameter, let's also make that a 12.7. My cutting length here, this is, this is important. I want this to be the actual cutting length of the tool so that I'm protected against that overcut that you saw in the sample. So let's just say, oh, I, I wanna convert from inch to metric on the fly. So I'm gonna say that this is a 1.2 inch times 25.4. There we go. Now I've got the um, uh, cutting length set my overall length oh let's say this is three times 25.4 hey i can do math on the fly and my radius let's say this is a oh let's go a 0.5 millimeter and it's a three flute end mill as soon as i click on ok i get a graphic representation of the tool showing the cutting length the shank the overall when i'm happy with it i can call this whatever i want and say okay and now that tool resides in my library forever uh, i don't have to delete it i can pick it up anytime i want and create a new assembly with that i have the same thing with a holder there's a 100 millimeter standard i made there's a bt40 there's a sample uh, these can be downloaded direct from the manufacturer. They usually come in in STP and it's up to you to convert them to STL. However, there is also a catalog here. So if I touch the word read and pick up a catalog, here is a whole boatload of individual type holders that are already in your machine to help you out, make it so that you don't have to go and download additional tools. And there is just a mess load of them, depending on what kind of machine you have, Cat 40, Cat 50, HSK, they, they've got a whole bunch of them. And once they reside in your library, now all that we have left to do is assemble them. So let's do that next. I'm gonna come over to my tool data, and I'm sure all of you have seen this on your individual machine, but previously we've been doing an awful lot of work just on the magazine info tab. Hey, all right, there's, there's our tool. You may or may not have seen pictures like this. We're gonna show you how to take care of this little problem, but our offset shows up right here. So what I need to do in order to have collision avoidance protect me from a tool or a holder lumping in is move over one to our tool data tab. By touching this, it's showing me a library of all the tools that I already own. Not necessarily in the machine yet, but I own them. They're in the shop somewhere. They might be in the machine, but these are ones I've already constructed. Once you've constructed them, 
you don't have to repeat this. It, they, they exist. You just have to say, I'm going to attach them. But we're going to go ahead and create a new one by touching the Register Tool Data tab that's over F1. And now I need a tool number. Let's just say 500. The tool numbers are exclusive. They cannot be repeated. Once I create a tool number 500, I cannot create another one unless I delete this guy. So let's call this the sample. I have the opportunity to stress to the machine anything I want regarding the um, the abilities or the characteristics of this tool, such as, is this a large diameter tool? One where I need to keep pockets in the magazine adjacent to this tool uh, free and available. I could just say, hey, yeah, this is a large diameter tool. And when I attach it, it will automatically blank off pots that are next adjacent to that tool. Also the heavy type, I could say, yeah, this is a heavy tool. And what that'll do is it'll slow down the speed of the tool change arm so that it, um, it uh, doesn't wing a big heavy tool around. In our case, ah, this is just a routine tool. I don't need to do anything of the sort. So next I'm going to set the tool model. When I touch that, I get the graphic window that pops up. And the first question is, hey, which holder are you using? So I'll simply select the holder. I'll pick up whichever one I happen to want to use. In this case, let's just say, yeah, okay, that guy. Okay, by calling it up, now it's showing me a configuration of the tool holder, as well as the, um, uh, the mounting point for a tool. So I could, if I wanted to define a sleeve and tell it, this is like a, a collet chuck. Let's say that my diameter for this tool or this holder is gonna be uh, 0.75 times 25.4. We're still in metric mode. And my length, let's make this 25.4. Okay, change the mounting position to the end of the sleeve. Yes, I do, there it is. Now I've got a bushing sticking out of the thing. One more, I'll select the tool. Let's find my test tool that was that bullnose end mill by saying, okay, it now has pointed the, it's mounted the tool, but it's only protruded from my bushing by an amount of zero. Here's a really cool feature. If I already know what my stick out value is, I can touch the word change setting and I can give it a projection amount. Let's say it's a uh, uh, 40 millimeters. Okay, there it is. However, if I have already defined the offset of the tool, I could change settings and touch the word auto set. Now, currently the offset for this tool is set at zero. So when I touch auto set, you're gonna notice the tool goes all the way back up to the mounting, the gauging line. If I were to, uh, let's just cancel out of this, we'll cancel. I'm gonna go ahead and set my length of this. Let's add, oh, 125 millimeters. We'll call this a 125 millimeter. It's registered. Now we're gonna edit that, oops, wrong one. It should be 500. We're gonna edit that guy, set the tool models, do all of the things we did before. Find the sample holder, define the sleeve. By the way, these sleeves can be stored in the um, uh, easy modeling library as well, but I just didn't uh, take the time to do it. Times 25.4 and my length is going to be 20, uh -huh. Okay, there's my bushing. And now when I select my tool, pick up the test tool and I change settings. Now when I touch auto set, notice that it moved the tool for me based on that, uh, that value that's in the offset. And that's really a cool thing because, hey, all right, I know there's a problem with my offset because that's not what my physical tool looks like. Once that's all done, I will say OK and it will store it in my tool data library. And again, I don't have to mess with it again unless the relationship of the tool to the end of the uh, holder changes. Let's just grab this guy and say, for instance, that previously there's my offset 
Previously, I had it sticking out yay far. If now it's a little further and I change that offset, let's just add, oh, let's go 10 millimeters. There. Now, if I go back to my uh, edit tool data, set tool properties, this time when I change settings and say auto set, notice it moved the tool for me. Saying okay, now my graphic and my tool model agree with one another. One more little thing to point out to you. I'm going to get in here and I'm gonna add out minus 20 millimeters to my offset. Click on the word okay. I didn't update my tool model. So now when this tool is highlighted, I'll get this little uh, warning down at the bottom. Tool length offset differs from sticking out of the model. Hey, that's kind of neat. It's a little warning that there's a problem between my physical world and my, my dimensional world. So there we have tool definition and I can just store these in my magazine as they come out of the machine, I could detach. Hey, let's get rid of that face mill. Now the face mill still exists in the, um, in the library, but it doesn't exist in the machine. Hey, when I go to stick it in, let's go insert tool, pick up the face mill, say, okay, it's now in pot number 10. Those of you with the matrix magazine, that's old school. You already know that, uh, how that functions. And we have all of our data. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and create a machining environment. Once again, from my main screen here, I'm gonna to touch the word work setup. Make sure that the collision avoidance graphic in the upper right hand corner is highlighted and touch the define jig and material. Now we're just gonna go through and we're gonna create the working environment that we have. There's the, the, the palette, that never changes. So the machine has it by default sitting here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by adding things. Let's start with adding a jig. And if I have not created it, I could touch new and yeah, define it from a primitive. But in my case, I imported my tombstone from the manufacturer as an STP, converted it to an STL, loaded it into the machine. So I can just say read. And there's my tombstone right there clicking on OK, it now has positioned it into the machine. Depending on how the manufacturer had defined their origin, ah, that's not how it looks. No big deal, Akuma is ready for us. Each one of these views has the ability to modify the location and orientation of the tombstone. So by touching this one, I could now set position this is the active screen. You notice the grid is there. And by touching the turn left, boom, 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 boom. Hey, now I'm oriented, but my area in space isn't quite right. So let's specify a position. The X, that looks good at zero, but the Y, let's make that zero and the Z is zero. Notice there's a little point where it's going to attach it. Okay. Once I have that in place, I could save it. And now next time I won't have to modify things in order to orient it properly. Or if I were converting this to an STP and I knew where this origin should be, I would modify the manufacturer's origin so that eh, I just bring it in and it's on the, it's uh, there on the, um, on the two, on the pallet. Okay. So, I'm not going to machine just a tombstone, so I now want to add a jig. And we will read. There's all the different things we have. Let's go ahead and put this, um, uh, oh, let's do the, let's do the sample vise. All right, I brought that in. Same problem. It's got, uh, it's got its orientation a little cocky wampus. If we look at it, it appears that all we need to do is move it out in Z and move it up in the air. Those of you that are really astute notice that, uh, oh, wait a second, the lug is down. We'll deal with that too. So let's move this guy out and we're going to bring it out in Z by say, oh, let's go, 
125 millimeters. Give it a preview. Hey, that looks about right. Okay. Now let's move up in Y by about 300. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. But as I mentioned before, how am I going to get the vice handle on there with the lug being down? So now I'm going to highlight th this guy because I can use my turn right and turn left to, whoa, in that nookie. Yeah, it still looks like it's a little low, so let's do a specify position and we will, oh, I know, we'll do a little relative move and have this guy go up by about another, oh, let's go 75 millimeters. Bonk, that looks pretty darn good. And now that I've got the, uh, the stationary vise on there, I could, easily mount it using that same process left uh, you know at, at uh, b90 b270 i could add more at this point i would also add the lower jaw on there using the same motion parameters and just have it stationed in the the right area once i say exit i could say transfer to cas or save this environment if i was going to use it and now there we go now I'm going to move this around and do a little magnification. There we go. I am now protected from running into my nice expensive Kurt Weiss. How nooky is that? Uh, one thing I did not do, which uh, is pretty much right along the same lines. Let's go def jig and material. I did all of this stuff, but I forgot about adding a blank. So add a blank. I could read it. There's my material. It's now positioned there. It's showing me my work datum, but currently the material is buried inside the uh, buried inside the tombstone. So let's move this guy and specify position will go out by oh let's go 300 millimeters just because i want to see the thing come out to to absolute add three oops three hundred preview there it is right there and now i could move it up put it in position and because this is showing me my current active G15, I could very easily move the material so that it lines up directly with that, uh, that compass rose. And now I'm protected. Exit, transfer to CAS. Obviously it's uh, the material's in the wrong spot because I didn't bother moving it, but you get the idea, right? So collision avoidance, this is an awesome thing to bring into your machine. Uh, saves you a lot of grief and wear and tear. Plus, if you have a multiple pallet machine, you can define each collision avoidance machining environment for each tombstone. And in your program, you can call up an individual uh, machining environment with the term CAS me. Instead of clear and draw, I will put in C-A-S-C-M-E and then the name of the machining environment. So even if you've got a 25 pallet uh, Fastums system, every time you bring in a tombstone, you can call up the CAS CME, read the machining environment for that particular tombstone, so you're not locked into one. Same if you've got a standalone that only has two pallets, you wanna read a new machining environment every time you change pallets, boom, you got it done right there. Hopefully this video helps you out in making a decision on whether or not the collision avoidance software would be beneficial to your company. If it is, feel free to holler at your local Gossiger applications or sales staff. We'll give you a quote on what it would take to put on your machine. If you'd like to see a little bit more, like and subscribe, leave a comment, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can. Thanks and have a great day.